We are live. Okay. Everybody hear me? See everything okay? Yes. Super. So welcome everybody to another London XL meetup. Uh, good to see everybody again. Keeps us going through this this time, these meetups and, and others. Uh, for those who might not know me, my name's Alan. Uh, I'm an XL trainer. Uh, I run the, the blog and the YouTube channel, Computer Gaga. And this is organized with uh, Tabor, who's all the people coming in and out, any kind of technical issues. Uh, from the tech productions who are behind the Global Excel Summit. Uh, today we've got uh, Jeff with us, Jeff Lenin, who, a little bit like me, also provides online training and runs a blog at Excel University and has a passion for you know, helping people use Excel more efficiently, really, and save time and improve their productivity. And I'll let Jeff maybe say more about myself, but uh, just usual housekeeping stuff and upcoming events, just to let you guys know. Uh, first of all, the chat uh, window, the chat pod, whatever you want to call it at the bottom, uh, feel free to get involved. There's people chatting in there, as I do <laughs> already. And just be careful of the drop down message at the bottom. And just make sure that's set to everyone and the chat don't message in people. Because unless things are in Zoom, you have a habit of automatically switching itself if somebody direct messages you. Just keep on that and, and please be involved. Uh, put your questions there. And uh, yeah, we'll either hand them over to Jeff as we go if it's appropriate, or we'll wait to the end and have a QA and a, a not last uh, kind of chat off there, which is always nice. Upcoming events. Um, I was setting this little slideshow up and I thought I've only got two events signed up. I need to actually start doing some work again. Uh, but next up we've got Michael Olafusi in a couple of weeks, Wednesday the 19th. Usual time so I can put higher at six o'clock uh, British Sun time. And building an Excel web ending. And then two weeks later trying to do these by the on a Thursday the third. So I'm trying to mix up the days of the week to accommodate everybody as well. Uh, we have Robert Mundigal uh, doing some dashboard stuff, analytical and interactive dashboards. So looking forward to that one. That should be another exciting event. Lots of different uh, themes behind our Excel events coming. And that's it. For me. I'm going to take a seat and hand over to, to Jeff, if he doesn't mind taking over and take us through our presentation for the day. All right, thank you, Alan. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Excel Speed Loop. My name's Jeff, and I'm glad that you're here. I'm honored to be presenting in this group. Um, it's such a good meetup, and thanks to Alan and Taya for coordinating all this. Um, I love learning, the th you know, things more things about Excel, and I love sharing the things that I've learned about Excel. So I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, and um, and I feel like we're all on this Excel journey, and we're all at different places on our Excel journey. Um, but we all start at the same place, right? We all open up Excel for the first time, we get this grid and it's like, okay, now what? So we start doing our work manually, just because we haven't learned all the different Excel features and functions. So we get a lot of our work done the slow way, uh, affectionately called the slow way, right? But we all have this same sort of goal, right? We all wanna use Excel more effectively to get our work done, what I'll call the fast way, right? And so really what is, what is the bridge here? Okay, well, the bridge is actually two things. It's process and Excel skills, okay? And we kind of need them both. So to break this down, the process is, think of this as the overall um, strategy, the overall approach. It's the way that we systematically optimize our workbooks for efficiency and accuracy. So the process that I teach is called the speed loop process. And that's what we'll be unpacking during the, during the session today. Um, and I want to really focus on teaching this process so that by the time we end, um, all of the seven steps are clear. Um, 
And, and in addition to the process, what we need to get our work done fast is Excel skills. And these are just Excel features and functions. These are index, match, sum ifs, X, lookup, power query, power pivot, pivot tables, you get the idea. So we need both. And so my goal for this presentation is to talk about the process. Now, along the way, I'm gonna have to talk about some Excel skills, but I'm not gonna really unpack pivot tables in great detail, power query in great detail, but I'm just gonna kind of cover them because it's really gonna help illustrate the overall process. Now, if you would like to grab the Excel files, feel free to head to excelluniversity.com slash global. There's no need to, to download these, but if you want to grab a copy, they're here, excelluniversity.com slash global, and we have the excelfiles.zip, and then we also have the presentation handout PDF. So feel free to grab a copy of these. Now, later, I'm gonna leave them up for the next few weeks, so no rush there, but, but these are made available, and these are the same Excel files that I'll be um, talking about and presenting with today, okay? So, what is this process? So this is the speed loop process, and this has been sort of an evolution over the last, <laughs> you know, 20 years, really. Um, and so, um, so it's, it's really um, clean now. And I really teach this using an investor metaphor. Okay. Um, and so we're going to talk about the three overall stages, and then we'll unpack all of the seven detailed steps here as we cover the session today. But, but at, at a high level, I teach this using an investor metaphor, and it kind of holds the whole thing together. So what does an investor want to do? The investor wants to invest wisely, right? They want to invest their finances wisely into assets that appreciate over time or increase in value over time to ultimately, what, realize again or get a return on their investment, get more money back than what they put in, right? The same is true for us, except we don't invest financially, but we do want to invest wisely. We want to invest our time wisely. So we're investing time. We invest time into assets that appreciate over time or increase in value over time. What are our assets? Our assets are our Excel workbooks, right? Those are our little assets. And so we want to guard them and cherish them because they give us great value. So we want to improve their value over time to ultimately realize a gain. And for us, our gain is what? Time savings. We want to get more time back than the amount of time that we put in. So that's the overall kind of thing that holds it all together. Now let's go and unpack all of the seven steps in detail. Um, I want to share a quick origin story of the speed loop origin. Okay, so I was the accounting manager at a public company and I was busy. That just means I had more work than time. I don't know if you can relate to that, right? But I was working late nights. I was working weekends. I had a very poor work-life balance. I was always stressed out. I was anxious. I would come home cranky, grouchy, like grumpy. And I felt a lot like this dude, like, no, you know, like, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I, and so the, the interesting thing though is out of this experience or out of this pain came the speed loop. And so this was when I really first started saying, how can I systematically and rigorously start to optimize my workbooks? I got to get my work done faster. And so this was really the origin about 20 years ago. And over the years, I've kind of polished it up a little bit, but, but this was really where the speed loop comes from. So the first stage is this I stage, invest. And so there's, you know, I started all the words to start with the letter I to kind of keep it easy to remember. But here we're going to invest time wisely. To do that, we need to do two steps, identify and insert. What they stand for is this, identify recurring project workbooks, right? Because if we're going to invest time, those are the only ones that have the ability to give us any efficiency dividends, right? Those workbooks we update every day, week, month, quarter, year, right? Recurring use workbooks. So we want to identify and organize our recurring project workbooks. I don't know what you're working on, but some project that you do every day, week, month, quarter, year, locate the files that we use to support them. So that's the identify step. Once we've identified those, you know, set of workbooks, we need to prepare them for the loop for this next stage. In order to prepare these workbooks for the loop, we need to insert lead sheets. Insert lead sheets. What's a lead sheet? It's not any kind of an Excel feature function. It's not a command. It's just a name that I use because it reminds me that these sheets come first. 
They come before the actual data sheets. They come before all the reports. They are administrative in nature. They help us stay organized and stay focused on implementing this speed loop. Okay, so to make this more concrete, I'm gonna to flip to Excel. Now, let's say that I have located a recurring project workbook. And this workbook here is called monthly report. And it's one that I update every month, okay? And so I maybe have some data. Where does this data come from? Doesn't matter. Maybe I download it from an ERP system, from an accounting system, depending on what you're working on. You may download it from an HR system, AP system, AR system, inventory system, you get the idea. We export some data from somewhere. We paste it into our data sheet and then we build some type of report, right? In this case, it's just a simple formula-based report. Maybe what you're working on is like charts or graphs or pivot tables, but you get the idea. And I'm updating this report every day, week, month, quarter, year. So I've identified this recurring project workbook. I wanna send it through this speed loop process, so I need to prepare it for what comes next. To prepare it, I need to insert lead sheets. So let me flip to this workbook here called Lead Sheets. And by the way, this is made available for download. And the idea is this is just a starting point. And so you're gonna to wanna to take what you like, delete the stuff that you don't, add stuff that you need, but it's like a little um, backpack or like a little briefcase. And so you'd throw this on your network somewhere and then you've got access to all of your lead sheets, the ones that you might need to insert into your recurring project workbooks. So to kind of give some, some illustrations of this, um, here's a start here sheet. And, and this would contain like the purpose, uh, maybe some input cells where we store some variables. Maybe we have some instructions for how to update this every month, maybe some assumptions. We also have an error check worksheet. And this is a very critical um, worksheet or lead sheet to insert because this is gonna help Excel help us with our review. So we would have different tests and we're gonna unpack this as we go, but we have different tests for everything that we would ordinarily look for manually. So things like, do debits equal credits? Does the detail on the, de on the, on the detail page tie to the, to the total on the summary page? Do assets equal liabilities and equity? So depending on what you're working on, you get the idea. But here we'd have one test for everything that we would ordinarily manually spot check, All right? Depending on what you're working on, you may wanna have an admin sheet you may wanna have a data flow diagram. Maybe this documents the source of the data. What are the data columns? What are the data types? How does the data flow through the workbook? Stuff like that. Maybe you have a lot of instructions, so you break it out onto its own sheet, assumptions, change log, and you get the idea. These are administrative in nature. These come first, and these just help us organize and optimize our workbooks for efficiency and accuracy. So. The way that we insert these lead sheets, it's easy. We're just gonna pick the sheet or sheets that we want to insert. In this case, I'm gonna group select, start here, error check and admin. And then I'm just gonna right click, move or copy sheets. And I'm gonna move a copy to the monthly report and create a copy and click okay. And now we have these three sheets inside of the monthly report workbook. And we would just repeat that process for all of the recurring project workbooks. Once we're done, then I'm gonna close this lead sheets workbook because I don't need it anymore. And now we have installed the lead sheets. Now, the next thing that's very important is this, documenting our manual steps. These are called instructions. And so what they are is list every single manual step that's required to update this workbook every day, week, month, quarter, year, right? This is a list of steps. Copy, paste the accounting system data into the data sheet. Enter the effective date into the report. Enter the effective date into the data sheet, and so on and so forth. I like to have a little time column, and it doesn't have to be super precise. I just use like five minute, one minute, 10 minutes. And the idea here is we can ballpark or estimate the amount of time each manual step takes, and that's gonna give us two key benefits. First of all, it's gonna help us prioritize which steps to automate first, okay? The ones that take the most time. In other words, this list of steps that we manually do every day, week, month, quarter, year, these are the steps that we're going to effectively delegate to Excel. We're gonna get Excel to do these steps for us. That's how we're gonna get fast at Excel. So I like to have a time column because it helps us prioritize which steps we want us to tackle first. The other thing that it helps us do is, and depending on where you work, 
depending on what your role is, depending on if you have annual reviews, which determine your bonuses and pay raises, this kind of information could come in handy. I'm just saying, right? Like, hey boss, look over the last year, I was able to automate all this stuff. I've saved like 20 hours a month, like show me the money. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, so, so those are a couple of benefits of keeping track of the estimated amount of time that's required for each step, okay? So once we've identified the recurring project workbooks, once we've inserted our lead sheets, now we're done with the I stage and it's time to go to the next stage. So let's pop over here. And let's talk about the next stage, appreciate assets. Um, this, is, this is the predominant graphic within this diagram. And it's because it's the heart of this speed loop, right? It's the biggest visual. It's where we're gonna spend the most time. You're also gonna notice that I drew this with arrows implying a cycle. And that's exactly right. We go around and around for as long as it takes, right? So we're gonna get these workbooks. We're gonna put them into this loop. Maybe they're in the, work, in the loop for two months, three months, six months, 12 months. We just go around and around until we're done with this stage. So there are three steps to the appreciate asset stage. Remember, this is increasing the value of our, of our assets. Automate, anticipate, accumulate. And what they stand for is this. We automate manual tasks, we anticipate potential errors, and we accumulate Excel skills. So how does this all break down? Here's how it breaks down. The first step is we automate manual tasks, like which tasks? <laughs> the tasks we just got done doc documenting in the start here sheet, right? Those list of manual instructions. Those are the ones that we're going to automate. And by the way, Jeff, like automate, what is that like a VBA code? Do I have to do automation with VBA? And like, how does it? No, no, no. For purposes of our discussion, when we say automate, what we're really meaning is this. I just wanna get Excel to do it so that I don't have to manually do that step. And to automate these steps, we just use Excel's built-in stuff. We use tables, we use formulas, we use functions, we use features, we use Power Query, we use Power Pivot, right? We're just using Excel's features and functions to get Excel to do these steps for us. So that's what automate means. So we open up the workbook and we're like, okay, given our current time availability and given our current Excel knowledge, we automate as many of those steps as we can. That's going to help us improve efficiency. But while we're always thinking about improving efficiency, we also always want to be thinking about improving accuracy. That's where the second step comes in, anticipate. Anticipate potential errors. We want to think ahead, think about ways that the workbook can break, and we want to prevent them. We want to detect them. And that's where the error check worksheet really comes into play. It's really anticipating and detecting potential errors. And then the third step is accumulate. This means accumulate Excel skills. So what it means is this, I was able to automate as many of those things as I knew how to in the first month. And now I need to get some additional Excel skills so that I can automate the next step and the next one and the next one and the next one. And so Excel is so big, right? There's all kinds of different features and functions. I may need VLOOKUP, you may not. You may need pivot tables, I may not. I might need the solver, you may not. So we accumulate those specific Excel skills. We need to automate those steps in our own workbooks, okay? Cool? All right, let's go ahead and make this more concrete. I'm gonna flip back to Excel. Here we go. And let's just take a look at these, these manual steps. First, data source. Copy paste accounting system CSV export into this data worksheet. So that is telling me, hey, Jeff, we're gonna export the CSV. We need to open up the CSV. We need to copy it. We need to paste it here. And that's what this first step is telling me. So we're like, cool. Given my current time availability, given my current Excel knowledge, can I automate this step this month? And maybe I haven't learned about Power Query. So maybe it's like, I don't really know how to automate that right now. So we'll just leave it on the list. I'll do it manually till I can figure that out later. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Enter effective date into the report sheet. This is telling me, hey, Jeff, don't forget, every time you do this report, you need to go and manually type in the effective date into this report so that when you print it to PDF or deliver it, people know what period you're talking about. 
The other step that's related is, oh, and by the way, Jeff, don't forget that you also need to enter that same date into this data sheet so that we all see the date, uh, the effective date for this data source. So let's just zoom way out for a minute and let's talk about this kind of bigger picture idea here, which is this. Anytime we find ourselves entering the same exact value over and over again into a variety of different worksheets in this workbook, we can often get a little speed boost by centralizing that input and then pulling it out as needed with, with like formulas. So for example, here I have this input cells area and this is where I would store all of these kinds of values or maybe they're called variables, values that can change over time. Rather than hunting down all of these different places through all the different worksheets where I'm entering all these input cells, we centralize them on a start here sheet. Maybe you don't like the name start here. Maybe you call it settings, input cells, you get the idea. But we just centralize these inputs so that we can type in our input cells and all the rest of the sheets automatically retrieve them with formulas. So for example, if I go for 30, 20, 30, maybe it's something as simple as a direct cell reference. Maybe it's something as simple as equals and this and enter. Cool. Depending on what you're working on, maybe your formula is more complex. Maybe it's something like we use the text function to grab that date, but then we have to change the format to the month name fully spelled out. And maybe we have to use concatenation to say for the month ended, 430, 2030, for the period ending. Okay, you get the idea. So, you know, in this case, we'll keep it simple. We'll just use a direct cell reference equals this enter. And now from a centralized input cell, I can type the value in once and I know that wherever it's needed throughout the entire workbook, it's, it's just there, okay? So that means this manual step is removed. I can cut it and I'm gonna paste it into my admin sheet. This is where I'm gonna keep a log of all the things I've been able to automate, all the time I've been able to save. Okay, and I'm gonna print this out and take it into my annual review, right? All right, and so now I'm gonna go ahead and delete this. And let's take a look at the next one. Enter the effective date into the data sheet. I actually don't have to type it into the data sheet anymore, but I still have to type it in. So I'm just gonna change this to type it into the start here sheet. Cool, maybe that's all I can do this month. So I save close, move on with my life. Next period, I'm gonna kind of tackle some additional items. So what's the next one? If more rows in the data range, be sure to include in the report. Okay, so what this is telling me is this. Hey, Jeff, don't forget, when you exported some additional data and you paste it here, remember that if there are more rows than last month, be sure to update your report, right? So what this is saying is like this. Here's this, here's this report. This is a formula-based report. It uses a function called sumifs. I consider the sum is function to be a mission critical Excel skill. So if you haven't had a chance to explore it, hey, check it out. I have tons of freely available blog posts that you can use to dig deeper, but I think this is a really great function to know. So um, it's been around for a while. There's a chance you're already used to it, but if you haven't checked it out, basically here's what it is. It's a conditional summing function that says add up a column of numbers, but only include certain rows, okay? When we look at this formula, we're gonna see that it goes through row 19. And it goes through row 19. So that's what this step is here. That's why I wrote this step. Jeff, don't forget, if you paste in transactions, there are more rows. Don't forget, you gotta come over here and manually update the formula to expand down. So the question is like, how do we eliminate that kind of manual step? Well, it's easy. We're just gonna use tables instead of ordinary ranges. So again, tables have been around for a long time. There's a chance you're already familiar with it. If not, I consider tables to be a mission critical Excel skill. Um, there's many benefits to tables, but the one that we're gonna highlight now is auto expansion. Tables auto expand. So what we do is we convert this ordinary range into a table. We select any cell, insert table. Excel displays the create table dialog. We click okay and now we have this table. And there's a chance you're already very familiar with tables, but if not, I wanna just take it step at a time. So here's the deal. 
Tables have many special properties. And in fact, there are so many that we get a special ribbon tab. So when the table is selected, we get a special ribbon tab with all these options and settings, check them out. But the one I wanna draw your attention to now is the very first thing, and it's called table name. So tables have names. This table is called table one. You could give it a more descriptive name, but we're, we can use that table's name in our formulas. For example, equals table one. So I can refer to these cells using the table's name rather than an A1 style range reference. What we can also do is refer to a single column within a table. And that looks more like this, table name followed by the column name enclosed in square brackets. So we're storing our data in a table because tables auto expand. We're gonna reference the values within the table using this structured table reference, using this naming convention. Table name followed by column name enclosed in square brackets. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to update this formula. And again, the sumis function is a conditional summing function. So it's going to add up a column of numbers. So the first argument is the column of numbers to add. I'm gonna call it table one, the amount column. And then we give it a comma, and then the remaining arguments come in pairs. Each pair defines a condition. So it sounds like this. Add up the table's amount column, cool, but only include certain rows. Only include those rows where the table one's account num column, comma, is equal to our account num. Close function and enter. Let's fill this updated version down. And now let's test it out. Let's add a new row and see if this whole thing worked. The report total is currently 15,745, 15,745, 15,745, 15,745. Let's go over here. Let's add a new value, 430, 2030. I'm gonna add the same account, 5022 overhead of 1000. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but you're gonna notice that that blue-white shading sort of extended. That's because tables auto expand. That means that if I paste or type in new values and there are more, more rows than last period, yes, six, 16, 745. It means I don't have to rewrite this formula, 16, 745. So if we added another one, 4806, 430, 2030, let's go with uh, 5040. Let's go with marketing and let's call it a thousand. The table auto expanded. This works whether I type or paste and we flip to the report and yes, 17,745. Now I've, I've, I've added new rows for accounts that were already in this report, but now we're gonna talk about how do we fix it if there are going to be new, new accounts or new items. So let me go ahead and delete this. Let me go ahead and grab this manual step, more rows. That was a formerly manual step, but now the formula is gonna automatically update if we have new rows, so I don't need to do that. So that goes over here and paste. Let's go back here and cut, okay? Cool. That's an example of using an Excel feature to eliminate these kinds of manual steps. Let's go to the next one. The next one says this, hey Jeff, don't forget, Okay, if there's a new account that wasn't in there before, don't forget to insert that into the report. What is this referring to? Here I have my accounts. Okay, if I paste in data and there is a new account that's not in the report, it's not going to make it into this report. Jeff, time out. I thought you just said these tables auto expand. Tables auto expand, yes, but these values using this formula is not going to automatically like insert a new row. This is a traditional formula-based report. So what this means is this, when we have a new account, or depending on what you're working on, maybe you have a new department, new employee, new supplier, new vendor, you get the idea. 5060 internet of a thousand. So the table auto expanded, so like that's good, but 5060 internet did not make it into the report, 15745. So like, what's the deal? Well, that's what this step is here reminding me to do. Saying, Jeff, if you had a new account, then you have to insert it into the report manually. What does that look like? It looks like inserting a new worksheet row, right? It looks like typing in the values. It looks like filling the formula down. 
This is exactly the kind of manual step that we can eliminate when we use a pivot table instead of a traditional formula-based report, right? So if you haven't used pivot tables before, they're a mission critical Excel skill, but basically here's what they look like. I'm gonna select my data source and I'm gonna to go to insert pivot table. Excel is gonna ask me where my source data is. It says table, good. Where do I want the report? Existing worksheet. And I select a cell and click okay. Now, if you haven't used pivot tables before, basically what we're doing is we're gonna to try to reproduce this exact report, but with a pivot table. So with a pivot table, we don't write formulas. Instead, what we do is we simply define the report structure. And the way that we define the report structure is by inserting these fields, items, right? Trans ID, date, account num, what are fields? Fields are just the data columns, right? That's all they are. So we insert them into one of four layout areas, rows, columns, values, filters. So we're defining the report structure. Now in this case, I already know the exact report structure that I'm trying to, to reproduce. I'm trying to replace this legacy formula based report with a pivot table report. So it first starts with account ID. So we insert account name into rows and release. Then we do the account name. So I insert account name into rows and release. And now we have amount, amount into values release. And it's like, hmm, the values look good, like 15,745, 15,745, and like wages 2,300, wages 2,300. So like the numbers look right, but this does not look like this, okay? No worries. We're like literally five clicks away from getting this pivot table report to look exactly like this report, okay? So here's the five clicks. First of all, we want to change the report layout to tabular, okay? Step two, we want to turn subtotals off. Okay, looking better already. Step three, this is bold and this is not bold, so we want to untick row headers. Okay, that's just the bold font. Step four, we want to turn off these little plus minus buttons. So that's found over on pivot tables, analyze plus minus buttons. And step five, of course, is this number format. So we right click number format, number, no decimals, comma, click OK. Now, now we're looking pretty good. Now this can replace this formula based report. So we can just literally delete this legacy report. And now we've replaced it with a pivot table. The good thing about pivot tables is they dynamically adapt when we add new items. So let's give it a try and see if this works. Let's go back here, 4805, 430, 2030, 5060 internet, and $1,000. Okay, so the table auto expanded, so like that's good. Let's go back here. We still have 15745. So the deal with pivot tables is we just need to click refresh. So we can do that in a variety of ways. One way is to right click and refresh and yes, 5060 internet. So pivot tables dynamically adapt to present the data that is stored within our data source. And by using a pivot table, we're able to do what? You got it. Delegate yet another one of our manual steps to Excel. So I'm just gonna move it and paste it, come back here and delete this step. Okay, so those are just some illustrations or some ideas for how to convert manual steps into automated steps by using Excel's features and functions. So we would go through and we would automate the rest of these. And by the way, we're gonna go back to PowerPoint, then I'm gonna come back, we're gonna finish all these, we're gonna automate every single one of these steps, all right? So let's go back here and let's take a look at this. Oh yeah, some resources, okay. If you um, have not used the sum ifs function before, check out this post, multiple conditions summing in Excel with sum ifs. It's like sum ifs 101. It talks about the arguments, the order of the arguments, the pairs, the conditions, how it can do multiple conditions. So feel free to check that out um, if you haven't had a chance yet to explore sum ifs. Um, also, if you're doing a lot of reports where you have sort of um, labels that come out of one system, but the report labels are different 
for the report or for another system, then we can create a mapping table that sits in between. So um, feel free to check out this and let me just take you to these real quick. Just head back to the Excel University website. You can click on publications. This is gonna be a list of all the sort of, I guess, formal published books and articles I've done. Feel free to check out any that look interesting. Um, but a while back, I wrote this article called The Power of Mapping. Feel free to check that out. And that's gonna talk about sum ifs, tables, and setting up an intermediate mapping table. Um, in addition to these formal kinds of like, you know, books and articles, I also write informally. Uh, they're called blog posts. Uh, so feel free to check out the Excel University blog here. Um, and if you haven't um, explored some ifs, just click on the topic. By the way, you can always search, of course, um, but just click on the topic you want to learn more about. Here it would be some ifs. Feel free to check this out. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So there's tons of posts. Um, but early on, I wrote a post called Con multiple condition summing in Excel with some ifs. Feel free to check this one out. Also, while you're here, if you want to subscribe, hit in your name and email, click subscribe, and I'll send you an email every time I write something new. Okay. Now, let's go to this final step, realize gain. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. This, and I'm laughing because about what's about to come. So here's the deal. Um, Realize gain is all about leveraging our time savings. Okay. So we're in this appreciate assets loop for three months, six months, nine months, you know, however long it takes. And once all or almost all of those manual steps have been automated, now it's time to step out of the loop and go to this final stage, this realize gain stage. Okay. And there's two steps to realize gain, rebuild, reinvest. Jeff, you're making me nervous with this word rebuild. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're gonna rebuild this entire set of workbooks again from scratch. Jeff, you're crazy. I just got done spending three months, six months, nine months in this loop. These workbooks are dialed in, they're working great. What do you mean rebuild them? Yeah, rebuild them, rebuild them from scratch. Okay, and here's why, okay, I know, I'm crazy. I know I am crazy, that's all right. Um, rebuild them from scratch. So here's the thing. When we took our recurring project workbooks and we sent them into this loop, we were really constrained by legacy approaches. We're constrained by, like we inherit these, these legacy approaches. When we rebuild, we're free to use more modern approaches. So as a quick example, let's say that I built this recurring workbook five years ago, six years ago. Maybe I didn't even build it. Maybe I inherited it from my predecessor, right? And back then, when we wanted to build a pivot table from two different tables, we couldn't. A traditional pivot table has a single table as its data source. So to kind of work around that limitation, what did we do? We did what we all did was we brought in both tables and somehow merged them using some type of helper column, probably with VLOOKUP. And so when we're dialing in these workbooks, we're sort of inheriting these, these legacy approaches. But when we rebuild from scratch, now we're able to use more modern Excel approaches. So for example, maybe we use Power Pivot instead of bringing in multiple tables, having a helper column, which is a little fragile, using VLOOKUP, XLOOKUP, index match, whatever, and then creating our pivot table based on that. Okay, so you get the idea. Another idea is this, rewriting our formulas from scratch. Jeff, what are you talking about? I just spent months getting my formulas like dialed in. I know, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Most likely, these formulas were written before you stepped into this loop. And I know that the formulas you can write now after having accumulated additional Excel skills, those formulas are more reliable. They're more elegant, they're more bulletproof than the formulas that you could write three, nine, six, 12 months ago. And maybe you didn't even write the original formulas. Maybe your predecessor wrote them or maybe your predecessor's predecessor's predecessor wrote them. And I'm sure that you could write better, more reliable functions now. So we rebuild this, okay? The other thing is we look at them as a set. 
Okay, and now once the scope is fully known, we can modify the set as needed. In other words, what happens often is we build a workbook to do something, like a task. And then at some point, someone, maybe it's me, maybe it's my boss is saying, hey, Jeff, why don't we also do like this? Or like, okay, cool. So we do like a little side calculation. Hey, oh, Jeff, while well, you got the data in here, we might as well make it do this other thing too that we didn't plan for. So we kind of like tweak it and band-aid it and have all these side calculations. And that's what we end up with is this like sort of not like strategically organized or planned workbook, just one that's kind of haphazardly built. But now at this point, the scope of the workbook is fully known. And knowing that allows us to rebuild the set of workbooks from scratch more effectively, okay? So that's what I mean by rebuild. So let's make this more concrete. Let's head back to Excel and check it out. Let's go back to here. All right. Data source. Copy paste accounting system data into our data worksheet. Maybe this was built before we had Power Query. We didn't even know about Power Query. But now we do have Power Query, we know Power Query, and so let's replace this manual step using a more modern tool. So what does that look like? That looks like this. This is a manually inserted table. And to update it every period, we open up the CSV, we select all the data values, exclude the header row, carefully copy, come back over here, carefully paste, right? And, and the table extends down. We can eliminate that manual step also by using Power Query. So here's what it looks like, data. Get and transform. By the way, if you haven't checked out Power Query, I consider this to be a mission critical Excel skill. Hit my blog, there's all kinds of stuff available on it, but it's a really great tool to, to know. So I would go to get and transform from text CSV. And by the way, this pause, if you haven't checked out Power Query, its purpose is designed to help us get data from other places and clean it up on its way in clean it up. The techie term for that is transform or transformation. It just means clean it up. Delete unnecessary columns, filter out rows, do transpose, do unpivots, change the data types, all that kind of stuff. And we can get data from many external places, from all these files, from all these databases, from Azure, from like all these online sources, from all these other places. <laughs> so Microsoft's done a great job of enabling us to get data from many other sources. In this case, it's just a CSV, so no big deal. I'm gonna click from text CSV. I browse to the CSV file, wherever it is. And this is gonna open up the Power, uh, Power Query um, preview pane. This looks good. If I needed to do any transformations, that's just a techie term meaning change, I would click transform data. And once you get into Power Query, you'll see all the cool things we can do. Maybe I needed to change some data types, delete some columns, filter out some rows, remove some headers, remove some footers, all that kind of stuff. But in this case, it's pretty clean. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna load to, and I'm gonna send it into a table, into an existing worksheet right here is fine, and I'm gonna click okay. And now Power Query pulls these values in. And the cool part is, next period, all I need to do is right click and refresh, or head to data and hit refresh all and that's gonna pull in the values. And once you dig into Power Query, you're gonna learn how to change the, the file path or the file name if that changes. In practice, often what I just do is I have a file called you know, data, and that's what I connect to. And then every period when I export it, maybe it comes as data um, you know, July 31st. So I would just rename the file so it's consistent so I can just right click and refresh. But Power Query is very adaptable, many ways to address this. So once you dig into it, um, you can see the different options, but now I can simply tell my pivot table to update this table instead of my manual table. So to do that, we go to the report, we go here and we click change data source. And instead of summarizing the values in the manual table, table one, we just tell it to update the values from the current table. So here's our pivot table report. Here's our data. Now we've replaced this, like this. Let's move this over. So now I can just right click and refresh and Excel pulls in those values. So let's go back here and now let's take this manual step, cut it from here and paste it over here, okay? 
and let's delete this. Cool. Let's talk about the next one, effective date. Enter the effective date into the start here sheet. So this is reminding me, Jeff, when you export the data, be sure that you put this report date here because as you recall from earlier, that value goes here and that value goes here, right? So here's another thing to think about. If we zoom out for a minute, every time we find ourselves typing in a value manually, we want to think about, hey, is this something Excel can somehow calculate like for me? Because really converting a manual input cell into a formula is really the same thing as delegating that step to Excel. Jeff, who cares? This step only takes like literally like two seconds. I'm just typing a date, four, three, 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 like that's not the mindset. The mindset is if it can be automated, we want to automate it, right? That's how we're going to get fast at Excel. So there are many ways we could approach writing a formula to calculate this. Also, we could use EO month. We could use all these different things for now. We're just going to keep it simple. And I'm just going to say, grab the max value. And if you're not familiar with the max function, the match function returns the largest value of its arguments. So as I just get the max value from this column, close function and enter. And now this manual step is no longer manual because it's a formula. Formulas are a way to get Excel to do that step for us, right? So there's another step. Let's just cut it from here and let's just paste it to here. Let's go back here and delete. And by the way, while I'm here, I don't know if you, you know, use cell styles, but for me personally, I like to use these built-in cell styles. And I like to use the input cell style to communicate to me, hey, Jeff, an input is required here so that when I'm updating, I can quickly lock on to like, okay, what cells do I need to update? And then let's just keep it moving. So I like to use a, this built-in cell style to tell me, Jeff, this is a manual input cell. But this is no longer a manual input cell. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll just change it to something else. I like calculation, but pick any of these that you like. And now this is telling me this is no longer a manual step. Okay. And what about this? What about this review step? Can we get this automated too? Maybe. <laughs> Let's go to this error check worksheet. This is where the error check worksheet comes in. So remember, when we are systematically improving our workbooks for efficiency, we also want to be thinking about accuracy. And that's where the error check worksheet comes in. Think about taking all of the manual review steps that you do. Do debits equal credits? Does the detail tie to the summary? All those kinds of things. And putting one test here for each of those things that you would ordinarily manually check. Okay. So as an example, does the report summary agree to the detail? Okay. Yes or no. So if this goes out of balance, like if I type a one in here, then everything goes red. And I just do this with conditional formatting. There's a good chance you're already familiar with conditional formatting. To me, it's a mission critical Excel skill. So if you haven't played with it, check it out. But basically on the home ribbon tab, go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules. If it's equal to true, do green. If it's equal to false, do red. You get the idea. So you can set up, by the way, these tests in any structure that you want. But personally, I like to have one error check sheet where I can see everything. So it's like when I look at this, like I do my updates and I'm about ready to deliver my reports on this one like error dashboard, I can see everything. All systems are green, good to go. If there's any issue, I can detect it in one spot. So for me, I like to put them all on this one sheet. Take the ideas you like, scrap the ideas you don't. For me, I like to phrase each test as a question so that it's more clear to future users. What do you mean like future users? Well, <laughs> here's the deal. When you build an Excel workbook, it lives on even after you change roles and responsibilities, right? Like it's gonna stay there doing what it was designed to do. So you wanna think about future users and making it easy for them to update. So anyway, I like to phrase all my tests as a question and the affirmative means that the test is passed. So does the report summary agree to the detail? If this is true, it means my test has passed. So all I need to do is retrieve these values. There's many different ways you could go about this. For me, I'm just gonna use equals. I go to the report, I select this, 
Excel inserts the get pivot data function. I hit enter and I re pull that value back so I can see the tie out. Per the detail equals sum, many different ways you could do it, do it however you want. I'm just gonna grab this and close the function and enter. And now I have this. This is the difference. This is a simple comparison formula, does E15 equal zero. If you want to allow some change for rounding, you could do absolute values less than one, you get the idea, but you just put your test here. And then this uses the and function so that as I add new tests, this is like an overview. So I don't have to scroll down to see all of my tests, right? That's the idea. So now we have done this, so I can cut this and I can paste it over here. And that's it, that's it. Now our update looks like data refresh. And yeah, look at the error check. All systems are green to go, okay? So that's the idea of, of, um, of the speed loop. Um, and then the final step, and then I'm gonna start looking at the chat for questions if you've been putting in questions. Uh, sorry about that, but um, I've been focused here. I'm not done here. Uh, anyway, the final step is this, reinvest. Reinvest our time savings. What does that look like? Looks like different things for different people. What it looked like for me was, first of all, let's stop working late nights and weekends. Like that's how, what it looked like for me. I'm reinvesting my time savings like in my family. So no more late nights and weekends. Maybe it means um, we're taking half days on Friday. Maybe it means we're, we're not eating lunch at our desk in a hurried you know, manner. We can go out to lunch or, or you know, go out on the picnic table. Um, for me, what it looked like was this. I was hired to, to do this monthly close project that would take two weeks out of every month. And if you're not like in accounting you know, terminology, monthly close, it just means every month I had to calculate a bunch of numbers and deliver a bunch of reports. Um, I, when I was hired, that was taking two weeks out of every month. After I sent it through this loop, that was down to two days every month, same amount of work far less time. So I wanted to reinvest my time wisely. And so what I started doing was, hey, this is fun. Doing the automation stuff is more fun than doing like the debits and credits and like the reporting. So I was like, hey, who else needs help automating some other of their workbooks? And so people are like, hey, yeah, I'm over in AP over here. Can you help me do this? Yeah. Hey, can you help me automate my commission reporting? Yeah. Hey, what about patents? Yeah, bring it on over. And so for me, my role shifted from doing this mechanical work to doing this more of this continuous improvement. And that was a lot more fun for me. And so over time, <laughs> I had more time than work. I felt relaxed. There was no late nights, no weekends. I had a much better work-life balance. And I felt a lot more like this dude, just kicking back. Oh yeah. Um, anyway. So that is the speed loop. And I hope that um, there's a few ideas that can just help you systematically optimize your workbooks for efficiency and accuracy. Now, Alan, should I pop over to the chat here? Sure. Um, I don't think there was many questions really. There was a little bit of talk about the use of tables earlier uh, and whether they can you know, whether they imp imp uh, sorry, increase the speed of formulas or whether they potentially slow it down. I think uh, um, I don't know if you've got anything to add. There was a bit of discussion on it. Uh, but yeah, I'm a huge advocate of tables. Yeah. Uh, myself, I'm doing a formula masterclass tomorrow and that'll be one of the first things I say, but like, everything's based on the table. Yeah. <laughs> you Absolutely. don't need to collect a column at all. Um, <laughs> because we need them to be dynamic. Uh, we want our references to be more meaningful and so on and so forth. Um, Alan? Yeah. How can, can we, how do we have to type the questions or can we? No, you can ask, you can ask away, mate. Well, well um, Jeff, I think, um, I think this question, um, I think it's a general one, but how do we like, do you have any tips on when to break bad habits? like? You just mentioned a couple of minutes ago about the mindset. You know, the mindset is about automating, but what what tips do you have to just break those bad habits? Because what happens for me sometimes is just laziness, you know, it's just like, oh, I just have to do it again, but it's gonna pay off, you know, in the end. So it is. So yeah, so that's why I 
I suggest listing every single manual step because now it's visible. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I have all these manual steps. And that's gonna keep it on your radar. And maybe you're gonna get the low hanging fruit first, the first few months, you'll start to save a lot of time, but just make a commitment to yourself that ultimately everything, almost everything on that list, we're gonna get it automated over time. So we just, that's why it's a continuous problem. I, I had my workbooks in the loop for like practically a year before I was able to step out of the loop. Now I will tell you, I saw big time savings sooner than that, like after the first couple of months, but ultimately to get every last little thing dialed in, it just takes time. So it's, it's more of a continuous improvements idea. So yeah, that, that would be my idea there, Carlos. Hey, thanks, man. Yep. Okay. okay. It's hard. <laughs> All right. Feel free to ask your questions, guys, either in the chat, if you prefer, or you're welcome to ask Jeff directly like, uh, like Carlos. Oh yeah, I see some questions in chat. I can field those. Yeah. Um, when you delete something from instructions, should it be documented somewhere? So that's up to you. But I will say that for me, the way that my mind works, yes, yes, I document those somewhere and I, I paste them into the, uh, an admin sheet um, because admin just means like there's no active manual steps like the start here. The start here is like, these are the things I have to do. Admins are more like administrative notes. So I put those on admin because then I have a record that I can go back to. And, and it's like, um, <laughs> it's, it's multiple purposes, but one is just this feeling of the sense of satisfaction. Like, dude, I did that. And then the other thing is depending on where you work, you know, take it into your annual review and, you know, just remind everybody, you know, that you know how to automate everything you know, show me the money. Um, so cool. Hey, thanks for the question. Um, it might be a good idea to have a change log sheet. Yes. So the change log I found to be very helpful. And for me, it was um, a lot about other people controlling what my workbooks needed to do. So for example, my boss goes, Hey Jeff, I needed to do this. Cool. I document your request. And then when I resolved it, so that in three months from now, when you say, oh, Jeff, I needed to do like, <laughs> not that. I'm like, dude, that's fine. But I just want to remind you, you just told me to do that. And now you want me to undo that. So, you know. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I like the change log with a list of all the, the versions or, or, you know, the additions. So that when a new user steps into your role, because that's what's going to happen. You'll be promoted. You're going to move roles. But this workbook is going to live on. You've got a nice history for them. So yeah, always be thinking about documentation for, for the future user. Hey, I got a quick question. Mm, yeah. How exactly do you tie in, say, like VBA and this up and coming TypeScript? Uh, oh, how do you tie it in? Okay, so, so here's the thing. Here's my philosophy. So take it for what it's worth. But to me, the best place to be is macro free. In other words, try to use the built-in features, functions, and techniques first. So I'm not going to write a VBA uh, macro that does something I can do in Power Query. I'm going to use the built-in stuff first. Only as a last resort would I then go to VBA or, or the new scripting language. Um, and so I save that for things that, that really there aren't any built-in features and functions for. So that's the way I view the world in terms of which of those two languages you know, I know that's in transition. I don't think VBA is going away, you know, anytime soon. Um, so I don't have a preference between which of those two languages. But in terms of just scripting and automation, I would save that as a last resort. So that's the way I kind of view things. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Um, kind of. It's, it's a good answer. <laughs> All right, but well, the same thing is I deal with a ton of data, so... I'm trying to figure out how to design a database. The philosophy, you know, of Excel online into it, you know, like the sharing, I think, sharing the workbook now, you know, it's now going from OneDrive or SharePoint, I think, because uh, that's new and TypeScript is so it's going to help out. I, I, was that your question, Patterson, or no? Uh, kind of. Sorry, I, I didn't hear all that. I was talking while you were. <laughs> Microphone is not on. Can you can y'all not hear me? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, yeah. I was just saying, like, I work with a lot of data every day, and I was trying to figure out if doing it with formulas specifically would be a better option than macros, because formulas slowed down a lot more than EBA, it seems like. Oh, are you just bringing data in from a data source and getting it into Excel? Well, it's more like 10 data sources, but yeah. And I, I haven't really done it with Power Query yet. Mm. Yeah, I would think that'd be a good thing to explore because Power Queries uh, will be able to, to pull in the, the 10 different data sources. You can have calculated columns on the way in, get it cleaned up, and that will eliminate the, the need for VBA to do that type of task. So I might be worth checking out. Appreciate yeah. it. Cool, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, on Jeff, you're muted. Oh, you're not. Du -du -du. Yeah, uh, those manual steps, <clears throat> this from Kevin, also illustrate what could be a discrepancy, how to recover from that. Those sheets are perfect for business continuity. Excellent, yep, thanks for that comment. Um, how about the older Power Queries built on SQL? Yeah, I'm not sure how to interpret that question exactly. I don't know if you like to unmute yourself, we can talk about it. Yes, uh, I just want to ask, uh, there are some queries that I built like years ago and they are powered on uh, SQL actually because they are the old uh, query. Uh, it was kind of plugin in Excel that, that you can go query and uh, I have a bunch of those and I don't know how to convert to Power Query. Is it possible? Yeah, I would think so, but I, I don't know if there's an automatic script that will do the conversion for you. I think you might have to rebuild it, but that's a little out of my wheelhouse. You wouldn't have to rewrite, rewrite the SQL code. You can just copy and paste them into the into Power Query. Okay, you can do that directly. Yeah, okay. you can write SQL code directly in Power Query. Okay, I will try this. Thank you very much. Paula, do you just basically set up a pointer to the SQL server and then you Yeah, copy so the yeah, statement? and when you expand the dialog box to advanced options, you can write your own code directly in there. Cool. That's awesome. So, but you have to be aware of query folding and a few other little bits and pieces, but in general it works just fine. Awesome. Thank you for bailing me out, Paula. <laughs> Just on that note, I'm going to have to go. I have to go and pick up my son from football. That was really good, Jeff. Um, it was an awesome presentation that I would love to see given to bookkeepers and small business owners and stuff like that. I think it would be well, well suited to people like that. As an accountant, I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was quite relevant. So nice work. Nice to Thank see you. Paul. And sorry, I have to head off early. All right. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> Cheers. Take it easy, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, Paula. Bye. Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much for that presentation. I'm afraid I have to dash off now, but that was very, very good and very instructive for everybody. I, no, I, really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Keep the questions coming, team, if you have any questions. Would you recommend any other Power Apps besides Power Query? I would start my, uh, I would start with Power Query um, and then you'll, and then I would probably check out Power Pivot um, depending on what your ultimate deliverable is. In other words, if you're just bringing in data, cleaning it up so that you can upload into another system, you probably won't need Power Pivot. But if your goal is to bring in data sources, combine them, and then create reports such as pivot tables or graphs, then you'll probably want to check out um, Power Pivot. And, and all that stuff is available inside of Power BI as well. So that might be something to check out too. Yeah, I was just wondering because someone was comparing the different things to the Avengers. So <laughs> I was wondering what the other tools were. The Avengers discussion, I didn't see that. <laughs> that was Carlos, I mean. Yeah, I was trying to find out if those were the Avengers, who's Thanos in this situation? <laughs> That's VLOOKUP. <laughs> the baddie that Power Query comes to be. All right. Well, y'all take it easy now. I got to go. But thanks for the discussion. It was great. Cheers, All buddy. Right, thanks. Thank you.
Thanks, Bye, Greg. Yeah, for me also, I really liked uh, the presentation and I hope my company will uh, update from the Excel 2000, uh, what was it, seven or something, so I can use Power Query too. So uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the video, for the uh, explanation. Thanks. You're welcome, thanks for the kind note. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation, Jeff. Thank you. I saw it the second time and uh, still worthwhile uh, watching it. <laughs> Thank you. I love talking about it, so I appreciate that. Awesome. Here's Christian. All right, Alan, I think we're looking good. We're going to be quiet. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jeff. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, sorry, my camera's not working at the moment. Um, so uh, you can't see me. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And it's very interesting. I, I've never used tables before at all. I don't even use VLOOKUP. I use um, VBA and, and uh, SQL statements. So I'm going to have a look at that. I did find that SQL statements did speed things up a great deal. Um, I don't know how much faster using tables is going to be. I'm going to find that out. Wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you for, for joining me. I, I think um, I, I love tables. It's, it's the source of all my expanding data because the auto expansion makes things so clean. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes, Peter. Jeff, thank you for a great presentation. Very clear, very concise, and particularly covering the basis of administration. Nobody likes to pick up somebody else's code to fix. And mm -hmm. I think the spreadsheets are even worse than that. <laughs> and uh, Alan, Tia, thank you again for another great uh, meeting. Uh, do appreciate it. Best wishes to all. Stay well, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Oh, there's a question too. Uh, I have a table in Power Query. How can I replace all null values from zero to, yeah, to, to null? So yeah, I would just group select those columns and then do a replace. And then you can search for um, null or, and, and zero and, and Power Query is case sensitive. So yeah, that might help. And oh, Faraz, yeah, you talked about that. Yeah, cool. All right. I think he was asking about um, if more columns are added as well. So I think you might want to, you know, select all other columns kind of option. Cool. Excellent. Uh, Someone's just yeah. signed up for your newsletter, Jeff. <laughs> Welcome, Chris. <laughs> um, Alan, um, one more question though. The, I think I didn't. I was listening, but I'm not sure if I if I you touch dynamic array. You did it, right, Jeff? Or you did? Uh, you, I did not. You did not. Okay, okay. But in the future, I'm assuming you're gonna you're gonna implement implement them, or still you wanna leave them like outside or not? I mean, what do you? No, think? we definitely bring them inside. I don't teach much about it because it just frustrates everyone when they say, "Hey, I you know I can't do that right now." So. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I I have several blog posts and a um webinar about it but um anyway it's just it's it's partially rolled out so we're just giving it time but it's definitely um something that's incorporated into and it gives us new it's like a it's a blend between traditional formula based reports and pivot tables because it has the formulas like we're used to but then they're dynamic like a pivot table so to me they kind of sit like as a hybrid right in the middle of that so they're really cool yeah probably next year you'll update your presentation jeff Yes, <laughs> that's right. Back again, Christian, number three. <laughs> Excel speed loop version two. That's right, 2.0. Yep. 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I have to go, guys. Uh, it was good to see you and uh, talk to you next time. Bye. You're going to jump in that pool, yeah? Yeah.
I will. <laughs> I saw it. Uh, I'm I'm on my phone and uh, I cannot manage it. Usually I'm entering. Usually I'm entering Zoom uh, from my PC and I don't know the buttons, so <laughs> it was my mistake. <laughs> Christian, this is the second time we listen to this uh, this presentation. We we saw in the uh, the Liam Bass. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. I told Jeff uh, I saw it again. I, this is the second time, and uh, I I'm still loving it. Yeah. <laughs> so, bye. Bye. Sorry, Sweet buddy. vacation, buddy. Excellent. I think we're all, all caught up, unless anyone's got a question. Yeah, I'm all good. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, Jeff. All right. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thanks for coming and uh, sharing the knowledge, sharing your ideas, and, uh, your thoughts. You bet. And I'll be, uh, I'll be, attending next month so looking forward to learning more excellent thank you thank you jeff thank you jeff thank you. thanks take care bye bye, bye. Cheers, thanks buddy bye 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 Ellen. cheers care, everybody bye bye thank you everyone if everyone's quite happy we'll look at signing this off thanks a lot for coming it's always appreciated i hope you get something from this meetup and uh from future meetups we hold Oh, cool. we'll go ahead and end the meeting now. See you later, Alan. Cheers, Ty. Take care. See you later. Bye. 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 Thank you.